I do feel that's in the way, actually. <laughs> so we'll see how it goes with holding it. So hello. So uh, my name is Venerable Chanda. Is it working? All oh, right. If you hold it like an ice cream, I see, but without catching the bugs. Right. Okay. So I'm Venerable Chanda. Hello, everybody. It's really nice to see you. You're all at a bit of a distance, so somehow I have to like send the energy out so that I feel connected to you. But it's really nice that you've all showed up and overcome any of the fears about viruses and this sort of thing, because I'm sure that the virus of loving kindness and the virus of being here together in the Dhamma will be stronger and will blitz away any nasties. So don't worry about that. Hopefully you've all taken precautions and washed your hands. This is my mother talking now. <laughs> so today we're talking about something which is called emotional agility. And um, I think this phrase was coined by a lady called Susan David who um, studied, she's a psychologist who studied at Harvard University and she's written a book about it. And I just saw a TED talk about her and just thought it was really powerful the way she talked about emotions and the way that we shouldn't really be suppressing and pushing these things away because they're part of life. And for me, it really resonated with everything I've learned from the Buddha's teachings. And I thought it was important to bring it up because sometimes in the Buddhist path, there's this tendency to feel that we only should experience certain types of more spiritual or elevated or evolved or beneficial emotions. And that there are certain emotions that aren't very helpful or that we shouldn't be feeling even. Right? Things like anger, is that really spiritual or is there something wrong with me? You know? Or even sadness or crying, tears. You know, we may have been conditioned by our families you know, not to show tears, especially sometimes little boys. Even yesterday I had um, a guest and a very nice man came over to just do something in the courtyard. He expected to find a big monastery and to bring his mowing machine, but we've only got a little vihara, it's just a little terraced house. So um, he just realized it quite quickly and did some pruning. But he said that uh, one of his ex-girlfriends um, used to say to him all the time, you should be more manly. And I just thought, gosh, that's so painful, you know, for a man to be told that. And for every time that a little boy or maybe a teenager cries, they're told to suppress those tears. You know, the other opposite could be that you're shamed for uh, crying in different ways, you know. Oh, why do you need to be upset? Everything's going well for you. There's nothing to worry about. You've got so much more than other people, right? And there's something that's not quite compassionate about that. And then we start to, every time we feel upset, there's this subconscious pushing it away because of the ways we've been conditioned to feel about these emotions. So we take a position about things. And when we take a position, we can't really experience things with an open heart. Yeah? So the Buddha said that the whole path, in a sense, could be seen as a very skillful way to develop to cultivate, to relate to, and to understand our emotions in a way that leads to freedom and peace. Yeah? So in a way that leads to, say, bringing out the best in ourselves, allowing that to flourish, but without suppressing, without pushing anything difficult away. So I wanted to give you the um, definition of emotional agility that Susan David um, talks about in her book, because it's very nice. And again, very close to Buddhist teachings. So she says, emotional agility means being aware and accepting of all your emotions, even learning from the most difficult ones. It also means getting beyond conditioned or pre-programmed cognitive and emotional responses, which she calls your hooks, yeah? in order to live in the moment with a clear reading of present circumstances, respond appropriately, and then act in alignment with your deeply held values. Yeah? So you can see even from this definition how when we get hooked on an emotion, you know, it's difficult to find that space between the stimulus and your response. Sometimes it's not a response, it's just a reaction based on aversion, fear, greed, whatever your kind of sticking points are. You know? And we don't have that opportunity to just meet it, first of all, and check in with ourselves, like, is this a wise way to respond? And is this a way, you know, of responding that is in alignment with my values, right? We all have values that we found very important in our lives, maybe compassion, caring, 
maybe being reliable or being flexible. Yeah. But, but when we have these emotions that come up and trigger something, very deep conditioning within us, we often lose that ability to navigate a response. Yeah. There was um, a Holocaust survivor, Viktor Frankl. Um, you may have read his book, I think it's called um, Man's Search for Meaning. Yeah, and he has a nice way to describe this too. He says, um, between stimulus and response, there's a space. In that space is the power to choose our response. And in that response lies our freedom and growth. Yeah? So again, it's about noticing that space. Yeah. So I think emotional agility is a really interesting term because we often think about agility as being a kind of physical thing, yeah? being able to move quickly and easily being able to kind of navigate. But when it comes to the emotional world, it means a kind of way to be able to maneuver between different emotions. So you can stay steady with an emotion, you can be resilient within that emotion, but not fixed and rigid with that one emotion. You know, it can become so easy to start responding in the same way every time a certain situation happens, to the point where we start identifying with that emotion and feeling that I am the person who has an anger problem or I am the depressed person. You know, we become very rigid and we're almost afraid to experience any other emotion. Interestingly, I mean, I don't only want to talk about the difficult ones. Sometimes positive emotions like happiness, joy, contentment, gratitude, love, these are actually very challenging to us as well. And I've taught recently quite a lot about contentment. And uh, almost in every retreat, somebody asked the question, but I'm kind of worried that if I'm content, I won't care anymore about the problems in the world. You know, if I'm really content, then what about activism against climate change or, you know, standing up for marginalized groups? We can't be content about that, right? And it's true, there are some things that we can't rest with, we can't be complacent about, but contentment and complacency are completely different in my mind. Yeah? Is it still quite low? Okay. You have to tilt it, so it's really close to your mind. That's it. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. So I was just saying about contentment and how contentment is very different from complacency. Yeah? So some people are almost afraid to become too content because they're not familiar with different energies that we can use to bring about change. Sometimes we feel we have to be angry in order to do something effective. But there are other emotions, such as compassion, you know, such as deep care for this planet and for the people and animals who live here, that we can get into touch with. And these are powerful emotions. We don't have to go with our negative ones. And yet, at the same time, we can harness the energy of the so-called difficult emotions and use that in a creative way. So the Buddha never made this kind of... He sometimes talked in terms of duality. But in many parts of the suttas, he also talked about how things like suffering lead to happiness. And there's a whole sequence of causality that he talks about leading from suffering to happiness. Because sometimes when we suffer, when we're you know, depressed or we feel like desperate in a sense for, uh, for understanding the meaning of our life, we want to know why we're here, what we're here for, how to respond wisely and compassionately in life. And this can lead to an openness to hearing the teachings. So in one sutta, the Buddha said suffering can lead to confidence in the teachings because the Buddha points towards suffering, but then he also says there's a cause and there's a way out of suffering. So it can activate this wish to be free from suffering. And then we have the path to follow and from the path, you know, if we're motivated by a feeling of compassion for others and the compassion for ourselves, it leads to joy, it leads to freedom. And we'll go into this a bit more in the afternoon because I want to talk about the relationship between some of the difficult emotions and, and, um, and the happy ones and how we can use both, basically, to cultivate the good within ourselves, yeah? But uh, this morning I wanted to just talk about a few ways in between the usual conditioned ways of reacting to emotions in order to first meet these things within ourselves. Because we have to meet something first before we can really understand it. Yeah? Ajahn Chah says we talk endlessly about letting go, letting go, not clinging to anything in the world. And this is kind of, in a nutshell, you could say, the Buddha's teachings. But then he said, but first of all, before you let go, you have to hold on. 
right? So he gives the example of, like, let's say a microphone, right? So I can't just let go of the microphone and, and you won't hear me and there'll be no teaching and you'll think you've completely wasted your trip. So first I have to see the microphone and pick it up and hold it. So first I hold it in order to understand it. Oh, it's a microphone. I can use this to speak into quietly or loudly. And then when I have understood it, then I can let it go. You know, in the breaks, I don't need to use it anymore. So I let it go when I don't need it. But if you don't, first of all, know how to hold and handle something, so if you don't know how to meet your emotions, how to handle them skillfully, we don't have an opportunity to understand and gain wisdom from those things. Yeah? And emotional agility means this ability to be able to gain insight from every experience. So not to say only some experiences are worth looking at and others are, you know, are bad or wrong or we shouldn't be having them. That actually creates a lot more suffering when we feel that something shouldn't be there. Yeah? So with emotional agility, we learn to have this very open and loving presence towards everything that arises. Yeah? So I don't know about you, but I notice in myself, you know, when emotions arise that are difficult, sometimes there are these automatic tendencies to want to either push it away yeah, or to kind of roll in it. Sometimes our mind just rolls in it. And pushing things away is very close to suppressing or repressing. Uh, it's like not wanting, keeping it at a distance. <coughs> so if this is my emotion, I just push it so that I can't see it. And how can I have an opportunity to actually see how it's caused and see what leads to its, you know, its release if it's so far away from me? So this pushing away is a kind of attempt to control things. And that increases a sense of self. I am the one in control. I don't want this emotion. I'm going to, you know, keep it at a distance. And actually, when you keep things at a distance, they gain more power. Yeah? So the Buddha said it's like a, a small monster becomes a big monster. And he gave this story of the anger-eating demon. This very ugly demon came into the emperor's palace and sat on the seat where the emperor should have been sitting. And this demon was so ugly. And I won't go on and on like Ajahn Brahm, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, basically what happened was that all the people in the palace got really scared of this demon and they started coming up and shouting and saying, get out, get out, we don't want you here. <coughs> and every time they said this to the um, anger-eating demon, the demon grew bigger, uglier, fatter, and more scary. You know, If you speak like that to somebody, they usually respond with aggression, right? So this anger-eating monster had fangs, and they were, you know, ah, who are you to tell me that? And he placed himself even more firmly on the seat. But then, after a while, somebody very wise came along. I think it was the emperor himself. And they realized what was happening, that this anger-eating monster was growing bigger every moment. So they started deciding to try something different and said, oh, welcome, monster. How are you today? I hope you're comfortable on that seat. Would you like a cup of tea? And I know in England, if you ask somebody that, oh, thank you, yes, definitely. So the anger-eating monster smiled and said, oh, okay, I'll have a cup of tea. And with every little act of kindness, this anger-eating monster started to shrink. Yeah? And it's exactly like this with the emotions in our mind. If we say, hey, I don't want you, get out of here, they just increase. The problem becomes bigger because you're feeding it with anger, you're giving it negative energy, and it grows and grows in your mind. Yeah? It's the same thing when we roll in emotions. If we're rolling in something, we can't see anything else. It's like our hand is right up to our face, and we can't see beyond that. Whereas actually, just a moment before something happened to upset you, you might have been feeling fine. You know? And it's important to realize that even when the difficult, troubling emotions are there, the love's still there, the compassion's still there, all your other beautiful qualities are still there. They're just obscured temporarily. But if you really start rolling in this, you can't see that. So rolling is kind of the opposite to pushing away. It's taking it up, getting hooked, buying into, making it mean something about me. You know, this means da 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 da. And so we become controlled by that emotion. And it's so close to our face that we can't get a perspective. 
So there are these different ways that, you know, I've noticed in myself can happen. And that's the point where we forget about that space between the stimulus and the response. We forget that there's a choice in there, you know, that we have a little bit of wiggle room to choose what's the wisest way to respond. And so the Buddha, obviously, taught that the first step in the practice is to become aware, yeah, to become aware of what's happening with mindfulness, in a way to know how you tick, to know how your emotional world works, yeah? And we have to do this in a very gentle way. So we learn to accept our emotional world, first of all, before we start to treat it differently or try to find skillful ways to relate. So the first step is just to accept and to hold it in a non-judgmental way, yeah, with a sense of curiosity, a sense of openness, courage. Yeah, all these beautiful emotions are already imbued in that awareness. And then the next step is to learn how to relate to it in a wise way, in a skillful way. So first of all, you meet a person. Like, what's the next step? Are you going to treat them with friendliness or, or you know, with aversion and hostility? So once we've contacted these emotions, we try to develop a, a wise, beautiful, compassionate way of relating. So this is what the Buddha called the second factor of the noble path, wise or right um, attitude, right intention. So we learn to relate with friendliness. There's a very nice um, Sri Lankan teacher who's passed away now called Godwin Samaratne. And uh, he has a very beautiful and loving voice. And I was listening to his talks on emotions. And uh, he was saying that one perception he likes to use is of the mind as a host. So you're the host and all these different guests come in. Maybe guests that, you know you don't necessarily like or feel that comfortable around or maybe guests who are your really good friends. So all kinds of emotions can come through the door of our mind. But as a host, we have a duty to just remain, you know, accepting, welcoming, non-discriminating towards everybody who comes in. So we just see ourselves as a host. And in a way, that already gives the mind a bit of confidence that you're bigger than your guests. Your guests are coming in and out, but you, the host, can remain friendly and in a sense can remain unaffected because you know these visitors are just visitors. They come and they leave. But while they're there, you treat them well. You put out the tea, you put out the coffee, the biscuits. Yeah, you put a warm fire on or central heating. <laughs> and you keep them cozy, you keep them warm. So we can imbue our awareness with these attitudes of friendliness and warmth. And this really helps to soften our minds towards these emotions and stop fueling the negative patterns Last Rains Retreat, I had a really nice um, experience with this because it's kind of drilled into me by, by my teacher, Ajahn Brown, you know, to use kindfulness, not only mindfulness, but kindfulness. So to add that element of kindness to the way you're aware. And sometimes, you know, you think you're being kind, but actually the mind's getting a little bit tight or tense. And I realized that in one sitting... I was sort of bearing with this troubling emotion of kind of despair and doubt and just feeling really quite unhappy. And I was feeling very sort of, okay, I'm sitting with it, I'm being patient, I'm being sort of steady and equanimous, fine. But I forgot the element of warmth. And as soon as I realized that I was not being particularly friendly with this emotion and I added that warmth, it was as though there were this bigger part of myself, like a big sister, a wise elder sister, or maybe a friend in my mind, who was just reaching out to this with a much more embracing attitude. And as soon as I imbued that warmth into my awareness, it just shifted immediately into almost bliss. Like quite a lot of happiness started coming up in my mind, just with this slight change of perception. And when these things happen, it's really curious and really insightful to see that, indeed, we do create our own reality, you know, to a large extent. Things are arising from the past due to past causes and conditions, sure, and you can't always do a lot about what's arisen, but we can do something about the way we're meeting it in the present moment, and that's where our real influence lies. So we don't do it in order to get a response or in order to get the happiness and the release. We just do it because this is the right intention. It's a wise way to respond. And it has to be genuine, you know. It has to be a sense of, 
um, friendliness towards the guest without asking them to leave. <laughs> yeah? In a way, you're giving your mind, you're giving that emotion what it's asking for. And when it's had enough of that, it will naturally start to fade away. Another nice um, perception is to be making peace with rather than doing a, ba a battle with. Yeah? Because sometimes we do a battle every day of our life. We're going into work, we're going through the rush hour, we're meeting colleagues who, you know, maybe have jealousy or authoritative issues with us. It's a struggle, you know, and we have to sort of toughen up sometimes, you know, to survive in that world. And then we come to our meditation and we don't always realize we're bringing that same attitude of doing battle onto the meditation cushion. You know, and, and in that way, we're just continuing the same programming, just in a different position, you know, cross-legged on the mat or sitting on the chair. You know, a person can look very peaceful with their eyes closed, but inside we're still struggling, yeah? And so my teacher always talks about making peace with experience, having an armistice with your mind. I really love this word. It's like a temporary ceasefire before a lasting solution to peace can be found. A lasting solution to conflict, rather, yeah, can be found. So we just halt the fight for a moment. And when you do this and you keep making peace, you keep making peace, what happens to that difficult emotion? That difficult emotion doesn't have any power anymore, and it starts to fade. It starts to fade because the peace and the mindfulness, this beautiful, peaceful awareness imbued with kindness, starts to take over and develop and grow. And after a while, you realize that what you were watching, which was a troubling emotion, has actually changed into the way you're watching it. So it actually becomes peace. The emotion itself becomes peaceful. Yeah? This is the power of the mind, the way that it can really overcome and soothe these difficult, troubling emotions that we do have. Yeah? So never forget the friendliness aspect. So we first meet, then we learn how to relate. And then the next... Uh, point is to give things space, like really make enough space in the mind to welcome all of these things in. And in the meditation, we can do this um, in a kind of physical way, because every emotion has a physical counterpart. Yeah? So when we experience things like sadness or anxiety, maybe depression, grief, anger, if you're very careful in attending to the body sensations, you'll notice that somewhere in there there's an emotion, there's a physical feeling that's like the counterpart of that emotion. Yeah? So it's quite easy with anxiety. There's usually a trembling feeling, sometimes in the chest, sometimes in the belly. Yeah? With anger, there might be heat or contraction, tightness. Sometimes the heart can start beating. Sometimes you see people and they get like red sort of, you know, all the blood comes to the face, they get very angry. And that is a sensation that you can be aware of. So it's very difficult to observe an abstract emotion. You know, if somebody says observe anger, you're normally just observing the thoughts of anger. This person did such and such, this shouldn't have happened, or I shouldn't have done, you know, responded the way I did. That's just the thought of anger which fuels the anger. But if you get into the body, you can start to feel what's happening. And you're not actually reacting to that thought, you're reacting to the sensation in the body. This becomes very clear with practice. And so giving space means sometimes including that emotion in the body, the area of tightness or tension or heat yeah, or trembling, but also widening away from it so that you include other areas too. So Sometimes you might you know, feel a very intense sensation in one place, but you can check what's, what's just next to that, what's around that, and widen and soften and include more. If you're really going through difficult emotions, it can be helpful to put your attention on the hands and the feet, the extremities of the body, because these areas are usually quite mild sensation and sometimes quite pleasant, and it gives you a sense of having some refuge in the body where you can stay and be quite peaceful and at the same time stay connected to that difficult emotion as well. I had a, a trip to Lanzarote several years ago. It was actually after I um, made the decision to leave Australia and to start a project over here. I am from England originally. 
But um, in deciding to start my project, I had to cancel my training visa in Australia. So it, was, it felt quite final and it meant le leaving my community over there. And, uh, and then I went on retreat in Lanzarote with a couple of friends who'd hired a little um, holiday place and we all had sort of basically a retreat. We were in silence most of the time. And I had all these kind of feelings and sensations that were quite oppressive and quite crushing, sort of wondering, have I done the right thing? And sometimes it felt like my attention was being like consumed by this, you know, really kind of going inward and getting fixated in a way on the difficult. And I just remembered this instruction to like expand, expand out from that, you know, don't let the attention just get pulled into the very obvious, very difficult emotions. So I kept expanding, expanding, and sometimes being just on the surface of the body, sometimes staying beyond the surface of the body, and just widening to this experience. And this was a great way of holding that emotion without running away from it. And after two weeks or so, I felt an energetic shift, a really strong energetic shift. And everyone else felt it too. You know, When I got back to England, I was completely light, much, much lighter, and really grounded at the same time. Yeah? So giving this uh, space means that you can hold things lightly, but also remain embodied. Yeah? And this is important when emotions are difficult, especially with things which can come up through trauma as well. It's important to go really gently. So this is the next one, gentleness. Yeah? A nice little simile of this um, I got from my retreat in Devon a while ago. Sounds like I'm always on retreat, and I'm not. <laughs> but, uh, but it's interesting. You get these little similes. So um, I was at Guy House, and the, um, I noticed that some people were using the vegan nut mix to feed the birds in the morning on the windowsill. Uh, and then I thought, well, maybe just a couple of cashew nuts. You know, I'll just see what happens. So I started feeding the birds. And all these beautiful little birds would come every morning, like the robins, who were quite aggressive, actually, and the blue tits and the wrens, and another thing which was like a... It looked a bit like a kingfisher, and I forget the name. It was a little thing, quite a rare bird. And the rare birds were always a bit more shy. And I noticed how, in the beginning, they wouldn't even come to the window if they could sense that I was behind the window. But after a while, they'd come even if I was there. And then the next step was that they'd come even if the window was open, right? Even if I was standing in the window, they would still come because they got confident. They knew they were safe and that nobody was going to harm them. And after that, I thought, let me see if they would actually eat it from my hand because some of them were quite brave. And lo and behold, I put a cashew nut in the middle of my hand and the little blue tick came on and had, had a nut from my hand. And one day, I couldn't believe it, I was sitting in my room on the floor and there was a chair and I think there might have been a few knots just near the sink or something. And another little bird came in and sat on the chair, came right in through the window into my room. And I thought, isn't that a nice analogy, you know, for the way that we can learn to meet emotions? You know, at first we're just a little bit too timid to go right in there. So we just stay on the outside, you know, just give it space. Don't go too close. And then after a while, we realize, actually, it's safe enough. You know, you gain a bit of courage, a bit of confidence. You can go a bit closer. Yeah? Until you can really go right into that experience. Sometimes even penetrate right into the middle of it. Yeah? With a mind that's gradually become confident, steady, empowered, yeah? courageous. But we don't do it all at once. The other analogy is like dipping your toe into the water as a child, perhaps, you know, when you're learning to swim. First of all, you have to test the temperature and see if it's really safe. And then after a while, you might go in and paddle a little bit, come out again. <laughs> little kids know they go in, come out screaming. And after a while, you know, they dare to go in a bit deeper, maybe up to the thighs. And before you know it, you're swimming, you know, and then you feel so at ease in the great big ocean. So in a similar way, you know, we approach these things gently and in our own time. There's really no hurry. And it's important to take breaks, especially when you are dealing with emotions that are kind of persistent or troubling or maybe a result of trauma, maybe emotions that you've been shamed 
for having. Whatever it is, you know, that you're finding a bit difficult, or even just you feel a bit bored and your mind's getting dull, just take a break and do something different. Yeah? So we haven't talked much yet about the positive ones, but you can also focus on that. You can focus on cultivation, cultivating qualities like metta, yeah, like contentment, compassion, or just being with, you know, just simply standing back and, as my teacher says, watching, watching the trees grow. And you can literally do that here. There are trees here, so you can go and watch a tree grow in your break. <laughs> Nothing much will happen, but... Trees do grow eventually, so something's happening in that tree. And, you know, it's important to get fresh air, be out in the nature. Maybe do some walking meditation. Yeah? If you want, you can do standing meditation any time during the day. You know, nobody's looking at you, so don't worry. Just be careful to maintain your balance, especially if it's warm in here. That's the important thing. So sometimes you can do standing meditation just with your eyes slightly open, just looking at the floor slightly in front of you. And just feel the weight of the body. Focus on the feet. Yeah? So whatever it is that gives you a little bit of a break. So friendliness, gentleness, it doesn't mean just going headlong into things. It means being really gentle. And the more I'm with my teacher, the more I realize the extent of that gentleness. You know, when he leads a guided meditation, it's just incredible. So much care just for, like, the nose area and relaxing deep inside the nostrils and just giving it so much care. You know, we don't give our body very much care. We tend to kind of push and pull it around. So before we start the first meditation, I just wanted to also mention a couple of ways of um, looking that help um, investigate these emotions. We've talked about just holding them so far, but there are also ways you can investigate. And the first one is to develop a perception that these things don't belong to me. Yeah? This is what the Buddha calls the perception of non-self. So emotions arise, feelings, moods, sensations, thoughts arise. But they're just aspects of nature. They arise due to causes. And they cease when those causes come to an end. Yeah? So when we think they belong to us, we really hold on and make them a problem. We cling. You know, this is something that's about me and I need to figure it out. It's important, you know. It might be here all day if I don't do something, or all year, you know. But actually when we realize they don't belong to us, we can just let go of that grasping mind a little bit, enough to notice that these things are arising and passing due to causes and conditions, and we don't really need to hold on or make them a problem. So you can even use little uh, mantras, if you like, such as not me, not mine, not a self. Yeah. Another one is like, not my business, not my business. So this thing arises. You don't dissociate from it. You're still with the feeling in the body. You know, you're staying present. But you're also not fueling that by identifying overly much with it or by thinking it's a problem. Yeah? If we think something's a problem, then it's out of sight again. We push it away, yeah? or we just get too close, so we can't see what's going on. So these are the perceptions of non-self. And the Buddha said, you know, the, if you're going to take anything as a self, I mean, he said the body and the mind are not self. They don't belong to us. But it's even more deluded in a way to think that this mind and these emotions are a self, because at least the body, we can see it. It's a physical lump. You know, my body's going to look pretty much the same all day long. So it doesn't arise and pass that quickly. But the emotions, the moods, the Im sensations in the body, they're arising and passing just within a blink of an eye so many times. He says relentlessly by day and night. It can't stay the same. There's nowhere to rest. And then the second kind of way of um, exploring is through the perception of impermanence, yeah? anicca. So noticing the changing nature. It's very obvious that things change outside, you know, seasons change, weather changes. In England, we're so closely uh, related to the weather. It's almost always the first topic of conversation when you meet somebody because the weather's constantly changing. So we can remind ourselves when things seem stuck or difficult or heavy that this will also change. There's a nice Indian story where there's somebody with a ring, I think it's... Um, 
yeah, there were two daughters of uh, a very rich man who inherit something from that man, and he gives a diamond ring and this very ordinary plain ring in his inheritance. And one of the daughters says, well, I want the diamond ring, and they have this big fight about it. She wants the one with the big jewel because it's a lot, lot more precious and valuable. But the other one's quite a wise lady, and she just says, yeah, okay, if you want that ring, you take that ring. I'll take the ordinary old gold or brass ring, and I'll be happy with that. So they wear this ring, and it takes years and years, but eventually they notice that underneath that ring, inside, inscribed on the inside, it says, this too will change. And then she realizes what her father was trying to teach her. In fact, this ring was the more valuable ring, yeah? because this ch um, contained this beautiful lesson that she could use for the whole life. So just these little sound bites, if you like, which are skillful ways to cut through this negative, self-centered thinking pattern that we tend to have can be really powerful. You know, this will also change. But at a deeper level with impermanence, there's actually a process going on all the time. You know, so yeah, sure, it's easy to see that anger's here one moment and it's passed away the next. But can you actually experience that emotion as a process rather than as something solid. So when we start to explore the sensations in the body, we start to see that they're made up of many, many small undercurrents of sensations, maybe pulsing or throbbing or tingling, maybe numbness or heaviness, tightness. But in my experience, it's not only one of these, it's many of these happening all at once. And it's really interesting when we can change our perception not to focus on the content of that experience, but to focus on the changing nature itself and to start to get in touch with this kind of um, feeling of like a flow or a flux of things just arising and passing so quickly. It's as though there's nothing to hold on to, like a sandbank. The sand just falls down the bank. You know? It looks like one piece from a distance, but if you look closely, there's lots and lots of individual pieces of sand yeah, with nothing running through. Or like a river, you, know, you think that there's this river that's flowing and it's the same river, it has a certain name and that's the River Thames or whatever. But anywhere in that river, the water doesn't stay even for one millisecond, you know, in a moment it's just gone. It's just different water, constantly moving past. So when we start to attune to this, it gives the mind a lot of confidence and courage. And again, I have to quote this lovely Sri Lankan teacher, Godwin Samaratne was his name, and he said... Um, the real security comes in becoming open to insecurity. I think that's so lovely because we can't be, we can't find security in the changing nature of life and things, and relationships. Everything is changing. Everything's in a flux. Everything arises, you know, just to pass away eventually. But we can find security in that awareness, which is aware of that and which is open and confident and courageous in the face of change. Mm -hmm. Of course, at a deeper level, even that awareness is changing all the time. But for now, it's enough to talk about just developing that sense of being open, being courageous enough to notice whatever emotion comes to mind and realize it's not me, it's not mine, it's not a self, it doesn't belong to me. And it is changing. So we treat it kindly while it's there but we allow it to go in its own time. Not according to our timeline, but according to its own timeline. Ajahn Chah used to say, if you're angry, just put a clock in front of yourself and time it. How long can you stay angry for, really? <laughs> so he had this kind of cheeky, tricky, sort of playful style of teaching. And I think it's quite, it, it, it brings some lightness to our mind and emotional world. So that's enough for now. So this morning we'll do a little meditation about